The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Jennifer Schaus, and welcome to our government contracting webinar series. We are rounding out week number seven. Today we are covering the Hub Zone certification, and tomorrow we'll dig into capability statements. Uh, there are 10 weeks in this series. Uh, next week we cover the veteran certification, financing for government contractors, uh, ITAR, GDPR, and the management section of the proposal. All of our webinars can be found on our website under the webinar section. They're all complimentary and they are all recorded. The recordings are found under the current schedule and there is a library of recordings. You can also find them on our YouTube channel. A little bit about us on this slide, uh, our services uh, based out of Washington, D.C., uh, our services range from anything from capability statement, market analysis reports, 8 day certification, GSA schedules, compliance, uh, and other a la carte services for contractors. We do host various events and seminars throughout the year. You can find them on our events page uh, or sign up for our newsletter, which now reaches about 11,000 government contractors in the area. Uh, my background is listed on this page, uh, but more importantly, I'd rather spend time talking about the HubZone certification, and I want to thank and welcome both Michael Hordell and Jeffrey Peterson from Pepper Hamilton. Thanks, Michael and Jeffrey. Look forward to hearing your presentation today, and I'll give the floor back to you. Jennifer, thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity. It's always been a pleasure to work with you. Uh, my name is Michael Hordell. I co lead the practice here at Pepper Hamilton. And uh, you have my information on this slide, which I really don't want to go through <laughs> at this particular time. I want to focus on uh, the person who is working with me, has to work with me for a year and a half. And uh, since he has arrived, uh, uh, this practice group has really uh, gelled very nicely. Uh, it was nice to be able to convince him to come to Pepper. Jeff and I have worked on small business issues, hub zone, obviously, and other uh, socioeconomic issues, compliance issues for large and small businesses, protests, proposal issues, cybersecurity. The clients find Jeff to be uh, top notch, as I have, and a pleasure to deal with. With respect to Pepper Hamilton, we are a 126 year old firm, multi practice law firm, and uh, cover uh, really the waterfront. I'd like to now, as Jennifer has pushed, uh, is let's let's talk about the hub zone certification. And uh, we'll have uh, Jeff start off uh, with the next slide. Thank you for that introduction, Michael. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so as a threshold matter, the first question is, why would you want to apply for hub zone certification? The short answer to this is that there's great contracting opportunities for certified businesses. The federal government has a statutory goal of awarding 3% of federal prime contracts to hub zone businesses. Um, and based upon current spending, that equates to about $14 billion annually. In order to meet that goal, many procurements are either set aside exclusively for small business, excuse me, for hub zone businesses, um, or awarded on a sole source basis to hub zone businesses. And for those procurements that are not set aside, hub zone businesses may receive a price evaluation preference of 10% relative to non-hub zone businesses. Um, the program also has some benefits relative to the other socioeconomic programs. Um, the 8A program, for example, has preset time limits on how long a company can participate. Um, for hub zones, as long as they uh, satisfy the other eligibility criteria, there's no um, limit to how long they can participate. Um, also, unlike the uh, remaining socioeconomic programs, there's no requirement that the owner of a hub zone business be in a certain socially disadvantaged group in order to apply and, and participate. Um, the hub zone program is really based upon the location of the business and its employees. I'd like to just say here that as an attorney, our goal in this instance is to advise and utilize the client's resources, manage costs, educate the client, and ensure that the business knowledge that the client has is incorporated into the decision-making process. Uh, this is all well and good. However, uh, we and the client need to be proactive in this area to ensure that the creation of this hub zone 
as you will see with some of the slides, is, is not a short-lived uh, process due to the hub zone, hub zone areas reclassification. Yes, this is common sense, but I can tell you over the last 40 years, it has never ceased to amaze me when a corporation totally relies solely on the attorney uh, to make these decisions and research and not incorporate uh, their knowledge. Okay. So uh, in order for a company to qualify and be certified as a hub zone, there are four main requirements the business must satisfy. First, the business must be a small business under its primary NAICS code in order to certify. And we'll get into NAICS codes a little bit later, but in short, the NAICS codes are a business classification system with codes that correspond to the types of goods and services that businesses provide. Um, a business can have multiple NAICS codes, but must designate one as its primary code. Second, the business must meet one of the ownership and control requirements that we'll discuss a little bit further on the next slide. Third, the business's principal office must be located in a hub zone designated area. Um, th there is a narrow exception here for businesses that are owned by um, Indian tribal governments, but for all other businesses, they need to be located within the hub zone area. And then fourth, at least 35% of the business employees must reside in a hub zone designated area. Um, this last requirement tends to be more problematic for businesses, and there's a few points of clarification. Um, First, an employee must live in the hub zone for at least 180 days in order to be counted. Second, both full-time and part-time employees may be counted towards the 35% goal, but uh, the employee must work for at least 40 hours per month in order to be counted. And uh, given the difficulty that a lot of businesses have with this requirement, the SBA has actually published a helpful tool on its webpage um, in order to calculate the employee percentages. Uh, and we really would recommend that companies use that calculator both when initially certifying and on an ongoing basis to confirm certification. And then um, I also should mention that there is a pending Senate bill that if it were to be passed would change that threshold from 35% to 33%. But there's a problem with that. I just want to let everybody know that the 33% I don't think uh, is going to avoid this part of a person issue. Uh, and I really think that it's important to attempt to get uh, more than the, the percentage in order to ensure that you will comply with this residency requirement. It is, it's one that they focus on and people have been removed from the hub zone uh, program because they do not have the appropriate percentage of people living in a hub zone. It doesn't have to be the same hub zone as the headquarters. That's a good point. Okay, so moving on for the second clear, or excuse me, second certification requirement uh, from the previous slide, the business must meet one of the ownership and control requirements contained on this slide. And I apologize for the amount of text on the slide, but really the most common scenario is the first bullet. The business must be owned and controlled at least 51% by US citizens. The remaining bullets are alternative means to satisfy that ownership and control requirement and are really only pertinent for specific entities that have uh, been designated by statute as economically disadvantaged, such as Indian tribal governments, Alaska Native corporations, Native Hawaiian organization were recently added, and there's a few others that we won't cover in depth today. So for businesses that believe they may qualify or want to qualify for the hub zone program, the first step is to identify the designated hub zone areas. So the Small Business Administration, the SBA, publishes searchable maps and spreadsheets of all the designated locations in the U.S. on its website, um, and we included the link at the bottom of this slide. The data is updated regularly based on. Uh, whoop, can we go back one slide, please? The uh, the data is updated regularly based on census data, legislation, and periodic employment analyses. And just as a word of caution, the spreadsheets on SBA's website are the most up to date. The maps that they publish tend to lag behind the spreadsheets, and uh, there are instances where companies have relied on their detriment to the maps to later find out that they were out of date relative to the uh, spreadsheets. And this is where you want to have activity. You have to be active as a corporation in the community. Uh, they have a chamber of commerce in that area to deal with it, 
deal with other business organizations that are within that hub zone because the designated areas are not static and it's important for you to be aware of what is happening and how the, the economy in this area is growing or not growing. Okay. So the next step for companies seeking to certify as a hub zone is to complete an application through the SBA's website. So there's a few initial steps that companies need to take before they start the application if they haven't done so already. And that's obtain a DUNS number through the Dun and Bradstreet website, which is a free number for government contractors. Companies need to register with the System for Award Management, referred to as SAM, um, as well as register with the Dynamic Small Business Search, which really is a beneficial for contractors because it's a tool that government contracting officers use to identify potential businesses that may, may compete for new procurements. So once those steps are completed, the company can apply for HubZone certification through the SBA's general login system. Um, and after the application is submitted, companies will need to submit supporting documentation. The uh, specific types of documentation will vary a little bit depending on the type of business, but it generally includes information like corporate bylaws, articles of organization, um, a partnership agreement if you have a partnership structure. Um, companies will also need to submit supporting uh, information to confirm the uh, residency requirements, such as tax returns, proofs of citizenship, lease and rental agreements for offices, and uh, payroll records. And what you want to make sure of when you're submitting this information is to demonstrate that you are a strong and stable company, and, and you do that with respect to the history of performance, and make sure that they you're, you're using, obviously, your primary uh, NACS code. That's critical in this time. I add one more point on, on this slide is that uh, companies really should closely review the uh, SBA's Hub Zone Guide to understand what documentation is gonna be necessary in advance of submitting the application. There's a 10-day deadline to submit everything, and uh, the SBA will withdraw an application if you fail to hit that deadline. So it's better to understand what your obligations are up front. Next slide, please. So moving on to um, common issues with the certification process, uh, the SBA receives approximately 4,000 applications per year for the HUBZone program, and about a quarter of those are declined. The, uh, the majority of the denials were based on either the employee residency requirement or on the principal office location not being in the hub zone designated area. And, and really one factor that, that leads to many of these denials is that the approval process is discretionary on the SBA's part. And SBA will draw what's called to, referred to as an adverse inference um, where information is either missing or incomplete. Uh, and then what that really means is that companies will not get the benefit of doubt if SBA cannot confirm compliance based on the face of the documents. Um, another common issue is business size. HUBZone certification requires businesses to be small under their primary NAICS code. Um, each NAICS code has a corresponding size standard that's either based upon um, an average employee count or an average revenue. And once you specify your primary NAICS, your business's uh, revenue and, and employee count must be below that, that specific threshold. Where a lot of businesses uh, seem to run into problems is with affiliation. When businesses calculate the uh, their revenue and employee count, that calculation is required to include the revenue employees for all of its affiliate businesses. The SBA regulations identify standards on which companies may be deemed affiliates of one another, and we included a table on the following slide that summarizes those standards. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail given our, our time constraints, but the purpose of the table is to highlight the different ways under the SBA regulations that companies may be deemed affiliates of one another, and these need to be taken into consideration when calculating your size metrics. Next slide, please. So after you receive your certification and begin to bid on projects, there's a few important requirements. Uh, first, you must meet the four eligibility requirements, both at the time that you submit an offer as a hub zone and at the time you receive any hub zone contract award. Second, businesses must um, attempt to maintain compliance with those four requirements throughout the performance of a contract. And then third, after the receipt of a hub zone contract, there are limitations on how much of 
the work that HUBZone businesses can subcontract out. And the intent of the rules is to ensure that hub zones are getting to perform work and not simply acting as a pass-through. Um, the limitation for supply and non-construction services is 50% of the cost of the contract. And construction contracts have slightly higher thresholds that are um, nuanced based on the type of work that the contractor will be doing. Um, an important note on these, these um, thresholds is that in 2016, the restrictions were actually revised to exempt some exempt subcontracts to other hub zone businesses, which means that, uh, for example, the 50% limit only applies to work subcontracted to non-hub zone businesses. Right, and one, one thing we want to focus on on this slide also is the attempt to maintain standard. Uh, this is a safe harbor when you're dealing with an existing contract, when the resident, if you are basically unable at, at during your uh, performance to maintain that 35%, you're not going to lose that contract. However, uh, remember that the attempt to maintain standard doesn't excuse that requirement when you're bidding on new reward, uh, new awards, or if they want to provide, if they, meaning the government, wants to provide additional work, then you're not going to get it. it because at any time that you get an award or get additional work, you have to meet those four requirements. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so while there are some significant benefits to the HUBZone program, there's also some risks that participants need to be aware of. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, SBA receives over 4,000 applications per year and frankly does not have the manpower to thoroughly vet every application. The result of that is that some companies may get certified that aren't properly eligible and, and really whether that's intentional on that company's behalf or not, it creates a risk for the company. Compounding that risk is the fact that hub zone designation areas are, are um, subject to change and decertified from time to time, um, meaning that you may have been compliant when you were initially certified, but you may become non-compliant through changing boundaries. Um, and, and that requirement really can affect both the principal office location as well as the 35% employee requirement. Uh, however, if decertification of an area does occur, there is a grandfather provision whereby an area is still treated as a hub zone area for contract qualification purposes for three years after the decertification occurred. And, and that's why we mentioned in the beginning to be proactive because you want to make sure that you can, you, you have more than, as much more time to actually benefit from this hub zone. The other thing is with these risks, you want to make sure that your application, the application information and also your proposal information is, is current and accurate so that there, you cannot be faced with uh, a, essentially a lawsuit that says that you uh, have misled the government in any way. And obviously we'll discuss that uh, in, in some of the next slides. So you would just want to make sure that you, uh, with your documentation, at least demonstrate that there is no intent on the corporate uh, individuals or the corporation in general to, uh, to basically mislead the government. Exactly. So this next slide highlights some of the penalties that companies can face for inaccuracies either in, in their application or certification. And uh, we have two more egregious examples here where the companies intentionally falsify documents in order to show compliance with the HUBZone requirements. In both of these instances, the companies allegedly falsified um, the location of their principal office. I believe in, in one, they were claiming that empty office building was their principal office, and uh, the other one was claiming that an equipment storage facility was the principal office location. Um, in the False Claims Act case, the company also allegedly failed to disclose it was affiliated with another company, and therefore not even small. There's a few other risks uh, that companies could also face, including loss of the affected contracts, suspension of arm, as well as other civil penalties. Okay. Um, so this next slide overlaps. Oh, you know, sorry. Jeff, before you, uh, one of the things uh, with respect to the last slide, I, I want to focus on the fact that you have to remember that your competitors are watching you and they can raise 
issues with respect to what you're doing. And and in this instance, and where in some of these cases, uh, it came on a tip, and therefore you need to be prepared to uh, address these potential issues. But you also want to remember that at no time do you want to give your competitors any thought that you are in fact not complying specifically with every requirement of the of the contract. And now we can move to the next uh, next slide. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. So now this next slide overlaps uh, to some degree with the risks that we discussed earlier, but there's a few areas that companies need to focus on in order to maintain eligibility. So first, companies need to regularly monitor the hub zone designations for their principal office and where their employees reside. Employees tend to turn over and move frequently, which really requires diligence on the company's behalf to track. Um, in terms of the principal office location, there was actually a, a 2011 report from SBA had found that 40% uh, of hub zone firms may be affected by um, expiring redesignations based on the principal office location. So it, 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 this is a frequent problem. The next requirement is that companies need to track and account for subcontracting limitations, which differ by different contract types. Third, related to the subcontracting limitation, there's a rule known as the non-manufacturing rule, which is applicable to supply contracts. And, and the rule generally requires that a hub zone business that is not manufacturing items is only permitted to provide end items that another hub zone business has manufactured. And finally, um, often overlooked is that HUBZone program has strict record keeping requirements for eligibility documents. Companies must maintain records documented compliance for six years from submittal. And uh, there has been instances where SBA will decertify a company if it cannot show prior uh, compliance with the program, even if at the time of the audit, it's able to demonstrate present compliance. And what you really want to be careful about here is uh, when we talked about at the beginning of this uh, presentation, we talked about being proactive. Well, it's important to be proactive, researching the history of the zone, identifying uh, community groups, and at also what we didn't mention was to establish a, a corporate culture of honesty and compliance and a compliance program that's applicable to uh, your corporation or partnership, uh, because you, you want to have this ingrained in the corporate process that you want your documents to be uh, very accurate and and uh, very easily uh, uh, recoverable for the uh, the agency if they're going to investigate uh, you want to have in the company a high integrity uh, atmosphere and it's very very important to do this and, and we have had situations where the compliance program has actually prevented uh, a potential issue which could have uh, uh, decertified the, the, the company. So this is something that uh, it might sound common sense, but we really feel it's important. If you're going to go into the hub zone program, you definitely want to be proactive. Exactly. So finally, um, in keeping with the theme of diligence, the HUBZone program continues to evolve and companies need to keep up to date with some of the significant changes. While it looks like we're a little bit short on time, um, I can quickly summarize that in 2016, we saw two significant changes to the program go into effect. And uh, there's at least a few more proposed changes to the program that we're currently monitoring. Um, I think I'll close with saying we highly recommend that companies follow these changes that may impact their compliance. Yeah, and let me just say finally that uh, Jeff and I thank you for joining us today. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call. We know this was a short, laser-focused discussion. Our contact information is on the last slide. And we uh, wish you all a, a great rest of the day. And uh, thank Jennifer for uh, the opportunity to uh, spend a little time with you today. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, Jeffrey. Excellent presentation on HubZone. Uh, the recording for this will be available later this afternoon. It'll be on our website. Uh, it'll also be posted on LinkedIn and on our YouTube channel. Tomorrow, we're covering capability statements. Next week, we get into veteran-owned certification, financing for government contractors, uh, ITAR, GDPR, and the management section of the proposal. 
weeks 9 and 10, we're going to get into GSA schedules, 8A certification, and sole source contracts. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks again, Michael and Jeffrey. Our pleasure. Thank you.